I hope you're well in these extraordinary times. I'd like to welcome you to the FinTech Finance Virtual Arena where we're hosting you today. Now, in this special arena, we're going to be discussing exciting developments in finance in Central and Eastern Europe. And joining me today is none other than Sergei Pandelit, who heads up the Bulgarian side of Varengold Bank. Now, I spoke with Alison Harwood from the UK side of Varengold Bank earlier this month, and I think it'll be really interesting to now from Sergey. So, uh, Sergey, for our viewers here today, can you give us a bit of background to your role at Varengold and Varengold itself? Yep. Hi, Doug. First of all, thank you for having me on your show. Friday, great day. I like it very much. <laughs> I certainly have those Friday feelings. It, it's like a sauna in here. The sun's out. I mean, I think this weekend's going to be great. I see. Great. So, unfortunately, not the best weather we have here in Bulgaria, but the rest is, I would say, relatively fine. Uh, spoiler alert to everyone listening and looking um, and viewing us. We will talk a lot about peer-to-peer, -peer, COVID, peer-to-peer, -peer, COVID, peer-to-peer. -peer. So, uh, I'm starting there. Varengold, pretty new institute, 25 years old. We just turned 25 years old. We are for, for three years now on the Bulgarian market. Bulgaria is kind of our hub for Central and Eastern Europe, and I will say even South and Eastern Europe, is known as Balkans. So, um, Varengold is doing predominantly two things. Uh, one, it's fintech. We are inspired by the idea to become the marketplace, I will say, industry banks or the bank of the fintechs. And second one, we are doing commercial and transactional banking for, uh, I will say, a niche corporate clients. I think for our viewers, the interesting part will be the first one, fintech stuff. So Southern Eastern Europe, I will say it's a very vibrant, very nice place to be. And that's why we decided to be here too. Um, you remember on the prep talks, we were discussing that Bulgaria and the cohort of the countries in Eastern Europe were part of the, I will say, wrong side of the iron wall. So when the wall fell down, uh, a lot of action, a lot of entrepreneurial spirit was around. So many different things happened. Different countries went with different speed towards, I would say, the more liberated capitalism way of managing things. And now even when we travel around with my colleagues, meeting potential clients across the board in CEE, in the fintech universe, it's always interesting to discuss how the, this transition went. So it's always a nice, I will say, conversation opener, but also you understand where we are seated and located. What I know from this conversation is that Bulgaria is a very vibrant place. We have more than 70 fintechs here. They are popping up every day. Of course, COVID slowed the things a little bit down, but still, I think we are the informal hub for the region. And it was inevitable for us, beside the fact that one of the, our anchor investors is also located in Bulgaria, us to be present here and to understand what's happening and to kind of um, say grow with the community here, which is growing quite fast. That's absolutely amazing. And I, I think, you know, starting really from the geography, it's such a brilliant top way down to do it. Um, and, and the history that goes on within Bulgaria and SE or Southeast uh, Europe, as you mentioned, um, kind of going on from that, then, recent geopolitical events and, and changes in economy must also be huge. So, for instance, Bulgaria, you're very close to Turkey. I mean, does Varangol have um, any interest in, in working in Turkey? Do you already work in Turkey uh, from the um, SEE side of things? Mm. So we are focused on European member countries. So how we are present in Bulgaria through uh, passportization of our services, basically, and that's how we opened the branch here in Sofia. So predominantly we are focused on European members. It's much easier and due to the fact that, you know, at the end we are bankers not techies, I pre, um, it is much easier and more, I will say, uh, structurally correct to focus on these markets. Turkey is a neighboring market. Um, uh, my pers I, I'll share my personal feelings here. A lot of things happened there, um, I will say, in the last uh, 10 years. Um, I don't want to touch the geopolitical side of it. Uh, I will talk about you know, business entrepreneurship. It's a very young nation. So a lot of stuffs are happening there. I know that card business, payment business, it's really booming due to the population growth there. But uh, frankly, with the latest development, I, I, I haven't overseen so much, so I, I cannot really guide you there. So for the time being, we are focused on this part. And who knows? 
when it's changing the positive weather. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot to cover in that, in that geography. Now, as I mentioned in the preamble, we'd already spoken um, with Alison, over, who heads up the UK side of things. Um, but you've talked to me a bit about Bulgaria, and Varangold is a, is a German bank originally. So, I mean, what is the lending ecosystem in Central and Central Eastern Europe like? Um, yeah, prior to COVID. So um, there was uh, historically due to the changes that we just discussed, this iron wall thing, and the, you know afterwards, uh, I would say transition period. Historically, the 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 ba- financial sector is I would say ninety five percent covered by banks, conventional institutions. It was the last ten years I would say where you see like really booming, you know, the fintech arena and all the ways of it. Definitely, it came from UK guys, because of that, and it comes down to Western Europe. But we are quite fastly innovating, and I would say in the beginning it was rather copy pasting, but now integrating new models, and you see really booming. You know, like the growth rate, the penetration is so low. I would say five years ago that it was how to say, you no, know, you just put one thing and it's just boom. So uh, in a way, uh, prior to COVID, you have a vibrant arena of countries which are eager to implement, but the problem here is that the sizes were very, very small. You know? In order to become relevant in a market where 95% or even 99% of the business is covered by commercial banks, it's not so easy you know, to really bloom. But I think in the, in the last year, the last two years prior to COVID, I would say 18 and 19, you really saw how on some of the markets there was really traction at the end. You know, there were really alternatives. And this is the sweet spot for us. What we are saying in our mi- mission and I will say vision is let us guys support these alternative ways to, to, to provide funding to people and businesses who, who for some reason are not able to get. And we are believers that fintechs is this alternative channel. And I will say more, uh, how to say, um, narrow means peer-to-peer, I think it's, it's basically the thing we really much like and supporting the lending plan. Yeah, I mean, so obviously being that, that almost kind of the lender of the fintechs, you're effectively enabling um, this fintech revolution to kind of keep going during COVID. So, I mean, as a result, you know, can I get your insight on on how the digital offerings are, you know, uh, are, are they becoming more prevalent in Southeastern Europe? Um, as a result of the pandemic? Yep, uh, definitely a visible thing. Historically, uh, I will say um, the entire market, if you look at it as a, as a whole, Central and Eastern Europe was saying that digitalization is going kind of slower pace. It was, of course, varying on the different markets, but it was given through the, you know, population reasons, perception reasons, technical, you know, knowledge reasons, etc. But COVID came. And all the projects that were, you know, digitally, digitally first, kind of sitting somewhere in the corner, were brought to the table. And a lot of things happened there, you know. But banks in this time were kind of ke- keeping up the pace of the fintechs because fintechs were born tech rate, right? So they were fully digital. And in a way, they really showed to the community and to the interested parties that they are very fast in keeping up with the requirements of their clients and they were kind of ready for this, right? Of course, COVID impacted in a way institutional angle of that or let's say the angle where the funding for those platforms was in place in March and April, but still there, I would say, infrastructure proven that they're really fitting to this situation, no, no, I would say, fully digital experience. While for the banks, they really showed that they were ready, they were faster to do it, but I will say they were in this time, they were catching up with the fintechs. And also another interesting trend we saw. Um, I'm sure it's in Western Europe also the case. You sh- you you show you, you kind of see which guys are really the good ones and which are how to say more the laggards here or the guys who were really coming late to late to the table and they were not really able to compete. So what we expect to see is that the prominent players in the region to become even more prominent and finally to show that they are relevant players and you, you need to rely to them because as you know in uk and germany there is this governmental support saying explicitly that funding should go through alternative channels right you have these themes there while uh, in our region here for some reason due to the fact that it's mostly driven by conventional banks 
government support to the fintechs to use them as a channel uh, for how to say facilitating faster full digital uh, lending to people and and small businesses is not really perceived hopefully this will be here i will use your platform to say guys think about it no our governments think about it because there is a nice change a nice chance that we can be really fast in how to say supporting the economy if needed after COVID. yeah i can imagine that. i'd love to hear your perspective on this kind of going on from kind of government uh back to back is what trends have you noticed in in fintech when it comes to southeastern europe you mentioned how digitalizing and you know bulgaria has become this kind of fintech hub in the area um but i'd really like to to hear because especially um when the market is less mature when it comes to technology it often has the chance to leapfrog the more mature markets for instance you see germany is still very cash dominated um, do you think Bulgaria is in a really good position to effectively leapfrog many of the mature markets in uh, the dark and maybe Western Europe? Yeah, um, that's why we are here actually. You know, we strongly believe that uh, Bulgaria can lead the cohort. Definitely we see it. We see the readiness of the people. Such an unfortunate event as COVID proved that we should focus more on this digital, digitalization, you know, in this digital approach that beside all this how to say negative feeling in people's about using digital technologies, not trusting to them, that this could be kind of a relief, you know, in, in this specific situation. And talking about fintechs here, um, I, I should mention that coming to Bulgaria, one of our first deal was we were we are partnering with the, I would say for the time being, um, one of the prominent players here in Bulgaria peer-to-peer -peer platform, it's called Clear Lending. And we are very, very happy with the performance. And what we saw is that during COVID, those guys really proved their model. Because if we need to be frank to each other, there was no real crisis that tested the platforms, right? They were born in the previous crisis and they were living in a times where everything was like you know, slap, slap, growing, not even like abruptly growing. And then COVID came. And that's why I'm saying we saw that the partners that we have picked, which was great on our side, proved to be resilient for the time being. I'm saying for the time being, because it's a very short, but hopefully in the, in the future it will be the same. And we show that um, if you have a good platform, trusted model, nice infrastructure, uh, scoring that is up to speed, I will say much better and much faster implementing changes compared to conventional institute. It, it is bringing value, first for your customers and for your investors. And you are kind of resilient to this shake around through COVID or similar uh, scenarios. Right, so we actually have a saying in the UK um, that, you know, uh, good times create weak people, weak people create bad times, bad times create good people. Um, and and from there, you get more resilient models and more resilient people. So it's really interesting to hear how, you know, the previous crisis created this kind of resilient FinTech core, as you, mm. you mentioned. Um, so, I mean, is that why Varen Gold looked to, to set up in Bulgaria? Did you see this 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 country that kind of um, typified this resilient but also very innovative fintech spirit? Absolutely, Doug. Uh, what we know, in, and I'm Bulgarian, actually half Bulgarian, half Russian, I should say. <laughs> but um, what we see, what we see, and what we experience every day in Bulgaria is this vibrant place. You know, things happening. I would say the government is not hyper supportive, but not against what is happening, you know. So there is, I will say, an ecosystem which was created with, by the efforts of all stakeholders. You have, I will say, uh, already well set VC, I will say, ecosystem, which is very important. We have um, a very strong startup, business angels, I will say, even ecosystem. And the needed ingredients to have entrepreneurial spirit growing up, you know the fintech you have it there you know you have the fertile ground historically bulgaria was part of the i will say the part of um, soviet influence where a lot of it specialists were born and prepared and historically you have this how to say it minded people now you have in the last years invest institutional investors coming in stepping in and you have the right mixtures to create this fertile soil parangol uh, told that this is a good I would say not a good, a great idea to have a location here and use it as a hub to cover the region. And as I told you, um, in Bulgaria and actually in the region, looking from Western Europe and even uh, US side, if you want, when you say Europe, it's kind of one thing, right? 
but you know better that we are different, you know, different nationalities, different specialties. And when you go deeper into doing business in different jurisdictions, you kind of start to understand that you need to have either local presence or somebody who is near around and can really understand the difference behind. So I think here the statement where you need to think globally, but act locally fully, fully, fully relies with the model of Varengo. And that's why we have the location here, which is covering this part. We have the headquarter in uh, Hamburg, which is kind of Central Europe, and then you have the UK part. Absolutely, Absolutely. brilliant. Provides such an excellent spectrum across the whole of Europe. Yep. Um, now, uh, going back to that, that kind of concept of um, being tech-driven, um, you mentioned in, in your opening uh, talk about uh, how you're going to be talking about peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, you know, when it comes to the lending space, how has Varen Bold um, looked to these fintechs and applied what they do so well? When you think of fintechs, you think of customer experience, you think of speed, agility. If you're the ones lending to the fintechs, um, how good must your service be, especially when it comes to customer experience? Because if you're lending to fintechs, they're going to expect the same level of care that they would give their customers. Doug, you just uh, tell a story in five seconds, which we are, I will say, <laughs> working for the last five years. But okay, I'll try to be <laughs> as short as you are. So. <laughs> Again, at the end, we need to be up to the speed of our clients. You need to the right to say, you know, our customers are extremely demanding. You cannot put product or a solution which is one size fits all, not at all. So uh, I think we are um, an institute where we are having the mixture of the background, the needed background to really talk to those guys, to understand what is behind, try to be up to their speed and sometimes advancing, you know, just to give them advice on certain areas on points. So, um, you know, hopefully it will be the same talking to our customers, but my feeling uh, already three years with the bank is that we are there, you know, we are there. We understand what FinTech is, uh, what peer-to-peer -peer is. We know what uh, good platforms are. We know which are not so good ones. We know what they need. Uh, we learn ev uh, ourselves every day, but I think we are able to meet their high expectations. What I know is that these expectations are gradually going up every day, every month. And now, even with the crisis, I think they will be even higher, but I think that's why this is why our job, to be there, to sit down, talk to the clients, and see how we can together do it together. Well, absolutely brilliant. I mean, that's certainly a, you know, a hard task to um, effectively, you know, FinTech for FinTech effect. FinTech, um, FinTech, yeah, that's yes. the one, yeah. Um, so, so again, going back to one of your previous answers, we were talking about the tech spirit that we find in Bulgaria. Um, one of the countries that I, I think almost is synonymous with FinTech in Eastern Europe is Lithuania. Um, you know, you always have, you have your Revolut and everything like that. So I mean, what is happening over there that you think maybe other countries in Europe or even other countries around the world mm. could learn from when it comes to FinTech? So Doug, I think, uh... What is happening there is actually it's not only Lithuania, it's also the three there, you know, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. It's kind of, of a block of, uh, of countries. Uh, I think it's a, a great example to what we just uh, spoke about earlier. You have a population of people who are very entrepreneurial in their minds. You have governments who are supportive, who want to see their countries on the next level. They are closer out to say to the trends across the sea. And they really can understand um, that the only way to have a competitive advantage towards the, I would say, older money and older economies, in a way, it's only to invest through innovation and education. And once you are doing that sustainably right for a certain amount of time, inevitable results are there. So if you provide a playground, a sandbox, if you want, this modern world, a sandbox, for the people to show their greatest without really, how to say, uh, impacting this or trying to regulate it, this is the result. Of course, it's a point with two faces. You should be careful not to not to be too much liberative in a way, because certain, I would say, negative um, uh, results may appear, which happens actually, if you remember, you know, through licenses and stuff. But I think this is easily, uh, easily amended through a rightful and on-time regulatory, uh, I would say, uh, correction. So in a way, um, what I can say there is 
I, ho I hope to see and I see every day more and more in Bulgaria is that you have on one side the right HR angle, so people, the right people are there. You have the right institutional framework and then you just leave them to work together in a way to understand that the only way you need to be somewhere better than somebody is innovation. And that's it. So interesting. <laughs> I, it, it's, for me, it's so interesting to hear stuff here. When it comes to governments actually just giving a hands-off approach, giving the tools, and then uh, letting their people succeed. Now, if we could continue the, the geographical uh, theme going across Europe, if we head further east, um, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, you're half, half Russian, so I'd also love your, uh, your your perspective on this. Now, there've been some incredible fintech developments in Russia, and um, you know, you hear you know stories coming out from Tinkoff Bank. Or, they're offering their customers and it, it's just incredible especially compared to even some of the, the challenger banks in the uk and even in china um what do you think the, the rest of the fintech world could potentially learn from russia and apply for instance in in southeast europe or even western europe so um bar and gold perspective definitely we are not present in russia not covering out of there but as i told you my origin i'm inevitably looking what's happening there Russia is a market of its own, right? So it's uh, so huge, so vast. And it has so many of, I would say, positive and areas and areas that needs further development. And I'm here trying to be politically correct. So um, I think FinTech is inevitably, as everywhere, trying to democratize these deficiencies or these areas for development for the country. Financial system, whatever, health, education, etc. So I'm hyper optimistic. The only issue there is I'm just jumping to your previous statement. You need to make sure that government is giving out say the right tools in the hands of the community and the business to do it. If you try to mingle this, you know, in a way too much government into business, too much business into government, it's not really happening, you know. The examples that you gave are extremely great because they just show that if you have the right ingredients, despite the situation, uh, political, institutional, or whatever, there is niche that you can address. And I think what clearly Russia is showing is that if there is a niche, there is somebody who can address it. Simply, you need to believe in the fact that this is in the in the health of all, you know, like all stakeholders. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So um, in a way, Russia, just a final words on my side, they're doing quite great. Historically, they were innovation hub, you know, you know, this competition with the with the Western world. There is quite fair technically, I will say, intellectually people who can really give us the new, the new unicorns, tech, health, whatever you need them. I think it's a way more of geopolitical disturbances rather than purely, I will say, business flows. So once this is solved, I think you will see much more examples of successful models which are tested in a very, I would say, challenging environment where they can really easily flow first in our part of the world, which is Central and Eastern Europe, and then probably on a wider area. Absolutely. That's so, that's so interesting. Thank you so much. Now, um, let, let's take it back to Varangal. And um, you know, what is your role as your know, Varangold um, in Eastern Europe and Southeast Europe? How does Varangold look to tackle the, the very different market from maybe the DAC region? Um, and how do you look to enable the, the fintech, uh, the fintechs in Bulgaria? So, um, starting from from the from the bigger part, we uh, we in Varangold believe that um, we are here to provide support to those companies, those platforms that are at the stage where they need to become relevant for the bigger competition, mostly with conventional institutes, banks, etc. And we would like to do that because in its essence, the peer-to-peer -peer model, peer-to-peer -peer lending model, it's a really transparent, sustainable, if you want, fair way to connect interest on both sides. And we think that helping those platforms, uh, no matter which part of Europe is, we are providing an alternative way for people and businesses to fund their proprieties, their, their businesses, their ideas, and in a way, putting the community on the next level. 
And we are a small part of it, but we are happy to do it. And we think and we hope and we are sure with the actions we are doing that it will come bigger and bigger. You know, this ripple effect. So having said that, being here in Southern and Eastern Europe, we are definitely bringing the know-how that we learned in the Western Europe market. And we are coming, sitting down with our potential partners here and up to the speed. You know, we are implementing stuff that usually will take more than five years. Now we can do it now, you know. Unfortunately, COVID steps in, which is bringing not only challenges, but also is a way for us and our partners to revisit again the business models, the expectations, and to show that if COVID or something similar happens in the future, it could be resilient. For the time being, this shows to be the case. Hopefully, this will be further in the case. So it is extremely interesting time that, you know, I know interesting in English is different means, but it's really interesting, challenging times that we are living here. And I think there is no better time to be around and to be able to support those companies to further grow and show that the alternative way or alternative finance should get its right grip and support the economies and the societies it operates in. And which is great, you know, which is satisfying, every day satisfying for us and for me personally. Well, and, you know, I think you, you, you did say the word interesting, but I think it does apply. I mean, the, the last time this happened was 100 years ago, and digital offerings weren't uh, obviously available in 1918. Um, you know, so we've kind of skirted around COVID-19, we've, we've talked about it in a very top-down approach of how it's going to change innovation. Um, you just talked a bit about how it's going to change the fintech industry. How's it going to change the lending industry? Because obviously, suddenly, um, we're going to see a whole lot more um, small, medium businesses, which a lot of fintechs are, um, suddenly either have to apply um, for you know for lending services. And what does that mean for Varendol? Is, is this an opportunity, as you said, to um, bring in new technologies, or is it a time to consolidate? So I think it's not uh, if or or. I think it's together. Actually, it's many things that needs to be put in one place. So. I'm a big fan of the so-called word um, co-creation. So I think what will happen is, and now currently is happening, is that is a lot of clever minds and heads are thinking of how we can prevent a really big meltdown economy-wise and how we can protect as much people as possible. So all means are, how to say, allowed. No, you see this huge liquidity, printing of money institutional thinking about it. You see the banks doing moratoria. You see the fintechs speaking to their clients, adjusting models, scorings, in only prospect to, to save, to persevere, how to say, um, their, their clients. Okay, so this one thing. And in a way, lending post-COVID in the future, I think will not change. If you think historically, banks or lending was invented for some people or businesses to take something now for which they usually they need to save for let's say 10 years or longer, right? It is not an obligation. Nobody is saying you should take it, but basically it's a way. And here it's a tricky part. Are you able to control that feeling that you want certain things now and not wait for that? And this is where education step in, steps in where you know fintechs and i think they're quite outspoken about it when they educate their people they say guys you need to be clever you need to do budget you know it will be the same with small and medium enterprises so i think now you will see a very how to say open conversation between stakeholders in with the sole purpose to pre, uh, preserve what we currently have to preserve the good economical health of all stakeholders and also to kind of together co-create our new bright future. Because then I'm telling you, COVID was one thing. I'm sure for one thing also, that change will come to our societies more frequent than we used. 10 years, it's a hell of a lot of a time. I remember the last few years, you know, and here in the region, we have even more. And I can tell you, unfortunately, that in the future, we will have more of those. More serious things are coming to our doors, which is climate, and, you know, we need to be uh, ready, radically ready how to address those. 
And I think we have now have a chance. If we are able to cope with the COVID situation, and hopefully no second waves, and all of us working together on these cases, protecting, persevering our economies, our way of living, and taking care for those who are not able to, you know, uh, take care for themselves, I think we will have a better chance of what is coming next, which is definitely challenging. I think that's you know a, a really succinct way of um, kind of looking to the future, and uh, yeah, it does almost sound like uh, you know the whole world is actually trying to, to work together on this, and it, I think that puts lenders in a really interesting position. So, I mean, if I could leave you with a kind of crystal ball type question now, what's next? What is next for Varian? So for us, what's next is we will be more active, more disciplined and more rigid in talking and uh, discussing with our existing partners uh, uh, of how we should tackle what is in front of us. Then uh, we will be much more, I would say, active and um, with open ears and eyes to understand what is happening around us and how can be uh, further supporting the the industry and the ecosystem we are part of, uh, part of, but never forget what why we are there. We do want to support the companies to continue doing their business with, uh, in a way that they support their clients. And at the end, um, there is this sense of, uh, of fulfillment that we were able to provide the alternative that was for some time, uh, for, for some reason missing. That sounds absolutely great. And uh, Sergey, so, yeah, I think that's all we have time for, but it's been really informative, especially learning about some of the fintech regions that I certainly haven't seen, um, you know, be front and centre for a lot of times, but it sounds like there's a hotbed of really exciting talent and innovation over there. So thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Doug, and you're welcome. Since COVID is loose, so please visit our beautiful country in the region and experience it by your own. I think you'll like it very much. I've heard so many good things about Sofia. I can't wait to go. Um, so thank you to all our viewers as well for watching. You can catch the rest of the series over at www.fintechf.com and of course YouTube and LinkedIn. So make sure to check them out and I'll see you next time. See ya.